Welcome to the Make a Mental Note podcast, where mental health professionals share information and perspectives that illuminate, educate, and is worthy of a mental note. And now your host, Chris Quarto. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Make a Mental Note podcast. I'm your host, Chris Quarto. I may have told you on a previous episode that one of my professional roles is that I'm a professor in the professional counseling program at Middle Tennessee State University. And it's the final exam time of the semester, which means that things are coming to an end. And for some of our students, they're coming to the end of their programs. My mental health tip today has to do with dealing with changes. Here's a quote I came across that sums it up well. I wanted a perfect ending. Now I've learned the hard way that some poems don't rhyme and some stories don't have a clear beginning, middle, and end. Life is about not knowing, having to change, taking the moment and making the best of it without knowing what's going to happen next. Delicious ambiguity. And you know who came up with that? Gilda Radner. You may remember Gilda. She was part of the original Saturday Night Night Live crew who eventually lost her battle with ovarian cancer when she was only 43 years old. The idea is to strive for the right attitude about change. And she's advocating openness, acceptance, and positivity. And one way of doing this is by telling yourself, What's happening is okay. I don't necessarily like it or I didn't ask for it, but these are the cards that have been dealt and I'm going to deal with it the best I can. Of course, it's a process to actually believe that a change, either um, a good change or a bad change is okay. But remember, acceptance and letting go, which are part and parcel to convincing yourself that something is okay, are in your control. So that's my mental health tip of the week. Okay, this week's guest on the Make a Mental Note podcast is Tamara Suttle, who's going to be talking about women in transition. So this kind of relates to uh, this topic of change. So without further ado, here's Tamara. Hi, everyone. Welcome again to the Make a Mental Note podcast. Thanks for joining me. Well, today I am joined by Tamara Suttle, who is a licensed professional uh, counselor in Colorado. And Tamara, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Chris, for having me. Well, thanks for joining us. Well, tell tell the mental note-taking audience a little bit about who you are and what you do for a living. Sure. Um, I'm a licensed professional counselor in both Texas and Colorado. Um, I've been in mental health for almost 30 years, and so as you might imagine, uh, my Focus over work has changed over that period of time. I initially started out working in agencies and inpatient settings focused on addictions and trauma. And um, around 1991, I moved into private practice in the Dallas-Fort Worth area uh, and was focused on mostly grief and loss at that time. And then in 2002, I relocated to Castle Rock, Colorado, where I am today, and I started over in private practice at 40-something years of age. (laughs) (laughs) These days, my uh, practice really has three separate parts. um, A third of it's uh, clinical work, primarily with women and healthcare professionals in transition. Um, Another third of my practice isn't clinical at all. It's coaching and training around how to build a strong private practice. And the last third of my practice is really focused on clinical supervision and training of new professionals who are pursuing their license here in Colorado. Wow, you are one busy lady, aren't you? I have a lot of pokers in the fire. <laughs> <laughs> well, 30 years of experience. You know, Tamara, I always love to talk to my guests about um, their stories. You know, how we talk to clients <laughs> about stories, about their stories. Well, I like to talk yep. to my guests about their stories, and in particular, how they got into the helping profession. So if you wouldn't mind, tell a little bit about how this all uh, got into motion for you. Okay, well, this is kind of a long story, so feel (laughs) free to cut me off or edit or do whatever you do with your long-winded clients. Um, um, Honestly, my story is a little naive and a little comical. Mm -hmm. I knew as far back as elementary school that I wanted to be 
a helping professional, but it took me a, quite a while to figure out what that might actually be. I thought that I would um, uh, be a physician, oh. but by seventh grade, I learned that doctors had to be good at math, and that was definitely not my strong uh-huh. suit. Yep. So I naively thought, well, I'll become a veterinarian. Not logical, right? <laughs> <laughs> by ninth grade, I figured out that uh, not only do veterinarians have to be good at math, but they also have to be good at science, right. and that wasn't going to work for uh-huh. me. <laughs> and I think somewhere around 10th or 11th grade, I decided I wanted to be Dear Abby. And then I realized <laughs> that job was taken. Like I said, really naive. Yeah. Um, by the time I got out of high school, it seemed like mental health really was the most logical fit for me. Mm-hmm. Um, my undergrad degree was in psychology. It was the only really mental health degree that I knew about at the time. Um, and I'm so grateful for that initial training in psych because it really did give me a much stronger um, understanding about personality development and yeah. taught me some you know, basic theories that I would not have been exposed to at, in counseling. Um, and, and there was the research class I took as an undergrad, I'm embarrassed to say, was in some ways much better than what I got in my counseling training. Uh-huh. But graduate school, I have to say, by graduate school, I realized I had more choices. Right. Um, there was, you know, psychology and social work and counseling and the field of psychology at that time. Now, this is really dating me, perhaps, but <laughs> but time, it really was focused primarily on pathology and quantitative research. Definitely yeah. not what my interests were in. Um, I looked at social work programs and uh, there wasn't much clinical focus in the programs that I looked at. Uh-huh. Um, they were very uh, focused on systems and structural structural support for individuals. And I found professional counseling, and it was focused on at least the program I was looking at uh, was focused more holistically on personal growth and strengths and cultural differences. And that combination really did appeal to me. So yeah. that's my Story. That's, that's how that's I a, got here. Well, you know, we share some things in common because I think it was I in third grade I had to write a paper. We all had to write this paper. And what do you want to be when you grow up? Right, and that's wrote, right. Yeah, and I wrote this paper. I want to be a psychiatrist, not knowing what the heck a psychiatrist was. Exactly. Was, Me too. Yeah, and my uh, my mom was a school counselor, and um, and I knew what she did, and I knew that she loved what she did, and she had a big influence on me. And so nice. I thought, you know, that sounds like fun. I don't know how I came up with psychiatrists, but I think I think I thought that a counselor was a psychiatrist. But anyway, exactly. even way exactly. back then, yeah, yeah. And um, I totally can relate to that. I grew up watching um, a soap opera called Days of Our Lives. Oh yeah, yes. <laughs> Dr. Marlena Evans was a yes. psychiatrist there, and to this very day, I still tape it, and periodically I have a, a, a Days of Our Lives binge, and I watch Dr. Marlena Evans. Oh, she really was an inspiration for me. That is so funny, because I think, <laughs> I, if I remember, I would have to go back and listen to one of my old podcast episodes. I think I had another guest that said the same thing, Marlena Oh, Evans. that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Who would think oh. a fake Psychiatrists could actually influence the field. Yeah, that's well. I remember Bob Newhart, the Bob Newhart show, and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, it was, it's fun. That's stuff. true. Well, you know, and um, well, I was I've probably been in the field probably about as long as you have. I, I'm just guessing because. Uh, when I got my master's degree, it was in community agency counseling. Now, back then, it was only a 33 or 36-hour program. And when I got uh, into the field, I worked in a, in a community mental health center at that time, and there was no licensure for, exactly. for counselors at that time. I think maybe Virginia had a counselor licensure law. And so we were kind of uh, out in the boonies, just kind of like, well, we didn't have any kind of professional identity, a strong professional identity at exactly. that time. Yeah. So it's exactly. like there's... I think that's there's, something that counselors actually still still struggle with. I think our field still is, yes. is trying to find their sea legs after yep. all this time. Yep, yep. And I think they've made a lot of uh, strides, but yeah, you're right. I think there's a lot of... Uh, ways to go there. And uh, so for me, it was, well, I'm not going to be able to move up in the organization. There's only so much I can do. So that's when I decided to go back and uh, get my my degree in counseling psychology, which at the time, that was a better um, career choice. Nowadays, I think for counselors, yeah. there are so many more opportunities available there, to them. 
Absolutely. There really are at, at the federal level, the, the state level and the, the local level. Exactly. For sure. Yeah. Well, uh, so uh, I wanted to bring you on today, Tamara, to talk a little bit about women in transition, because that's one of your areas of specialization. And yeah. uh, why don't you just say a little bit about that or talk a little bit about that, about how you got into into that area of counseling. Sure. So, so my initial training was in a type of therapy called Adlerian therapy. I yeah. know that you know what that is, yeah. but I, I realize that maybe some of your readers don't. And, and so let me just say that I, I, that type of work really looks a lot at the lessons that we were intentionally or not intentionally taught as children. Right. And how they serve us now well and how they get in the way of us achieving whatever it is we want to be doing. Uh And so um, those those rules that we unconsciously maybe um, grew into adulthood with, often when we look back, they don't fit us so well. Mm. And and so um, when I started... When, when my practice shifted into working more with women in transition, one of the things I started doing was looking at those, those rules with mm. my clients, those patterns. Okay. And, and um, I, truthfully, I don't even remember now if it was the women in transition that came first or those rules that started showing up in my practice that shifted me to those women in transition. Yeah. Does that make yeah, it, it, it was kind of like the chicken and the egg. I'm yeah. not sure which came first, but but what I learned along the way is that I really like helping women make those transitions, mm-hmm. make those moves, and you know those can look like a lot of different things. It might look like uh, um, some a, a woman who's going through a divorce, or it might look like a psychologist who is trying to transition with her client into doing something different and struggling with that. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe, uh, maybe her client um, uh, isn't paying her fees well. And so uh, the, the psychologist, I had a a psychologist as a client not too long ago who um, was really struggling. She couldn't for whatever reason, talk to her client about this little issue of not getting her bills paid. And I know that seems uh, bizarre if that's not you that's in that situation, but for her it was a really big issue. Mm -hmm. So we looked at her, I asked her to look at her um, pattern of of, uh, money and rules that she grew up with and if those might in some way be impacting what she does with her clients today and where she gets stuck having that conversation with this particular client. And she talked about, Mm, you know, family rules, like it's gauche to talk about money, and mm-hmm. we don't need to ask for anything. She happened to have been raised in a family that had more than enough right. when she was a child. Uh-huh. And so her family had rules like, you know, we help people who are less fortunate than us, and we don't take money from people who have less than we do. And we don't need money because, of course, they have money. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so helping that client of mine make the transition to a more comfortable way of of addressing those needs in her business is is just one example. You know, isn't that fascinating how you look back at at your own history or the history of clients, especially all those all those family dynamics and in particular those rules that um, are instilled in us. And I think half the time we're not even aware of of those rules and how they affect us. But boy, they sure do, don't they? They absolutely do, and and they don't just affect my clients' lives. They affect my life, oh. my rules, and my history. Yeah. Both support and contaminate my adult <laughs> life now, even at 56 years of age. And we talk about that as, well, in, in clinical terms, we talk about that as counter-transference, or it can show up Absolutely. as counter-transference. And so I... I assume that, um, you know, that can be something that you have to be aware of as a therapist yourself, don't you? Absolutely. And, and, you know, you've been in the field long enough to see the, um, the progression of our, our own professional ethics change. Mm -hmm. And these days we are mandated. It wasn't just, it's no longer just a good idea, but we really are mandated as clinicians to clean up, to be aware of and clean up our own counter-transference along the way. And that can look like a, you know, that can touch any area of our, our, our 
personal lives and or our clinical lives. Mm -hmm. Well, in these in these uh, the, the clients that you have, um, you know, there I, I would suppose that there are a lot of reasons that women want to make transitions. Have you found that there are some clients that you kind of listen to their reasons for why they want to make a transition and think to yourself, are you really sure you want to make this transition? Are you <laughs> really sure you want to do this? And what do you do in those situations? Um, yeah, I absolutely have been in, in that situation. And, and what I really want to do is help that client explore what her reasons are. Uh -huh. And her reasons are, are her, her desire to do whatever it is she wants to do. Mm -hmm. My job is to support that, sure. to help her look at that from maybe different angles. And certainly, I, and to put my own stuff in check a bit, I can have those concerns. I might even voice those concerns, but it's certainly not to push those on her. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think about um, a college student a while back who really wanted to be a PE major. Uh -huh. And her parents wanted her to be a banker. And she was starting her freshman year in college. By her sophomore year in college, she was needing to declare a major. Mm -hmm. And she really agonized with that. She wanted to please her parents. She had no interest in banking and finance. And she really did want to teach other people about their bodies and how to be healthy and using them in a physically active way. So I helped her just spread that stuff out on a table, so to speak, and look at the many, many options she had, including the possibility of intersecting those. And uh, don't ask me how you would do that. My, <laughs> I just ask to consider the possibility, because oftentimes we, we are drawn in multiple directions to things and don't know which choice is best. You right. know, do I leave a relationship or do I stay? Do I choose this major or that major in college? Mm -hmm. Well, and, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was and, just... And I was just going to say, we, we simply looked at those things and allowed her some space to unpack her brain and, and all the feelings she had about all those different uh, choices and pressures and opportunities, and, and then had her choose what she saw was the best direction for her life. And I guess the, the nice thing about counseling is that uh, it's, a, it's a safe place where people can talk about these things without being told this is wrong. Uh, you, you should be going down this path. You shouldn't be thinking about, you know, these other things that you want to do, that this is a safe space, a place for, for people to be talking about these types of issues. Absolutely. And, and I think that draws us back to my own issues with countertransference, Chris, because I was raised in a very um, good but black and white family. Uh -huh. They very black and white ways, as in there's a right way and a wrong way. Yes. And <laughs> perhaps you can relate. I, I don't know. Well, I grew up Catholic, and yeah, I, I can relate to a lot of that kind of stuff. And, and the, the Baptists did it the same way yeah. <laughs> while we were praying for each other, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> um, so um, uh, I had to get my own black and white thinking uh, around issues, and still sometimes, occasionally, it crops back up, and I have to go back and clean up my own mess. Um, uh, but uh, in helping clients see, really, that there are many right ways to get where you want to go. There is rarely, if ever, one right way to do anything. And I think that that's a real important point that you make there, Tamara, because it, it allows for many more opportunities. And I, I guess, well, I guess I guess I can see this in two ways. I was going to say it kind of takes the pressure off knowing that there's a lot of different ways that things can be done. But I suppose for some clients, having all of those different options or choices, ways of doing things, that, that could seem overwhelming too. Absolutely. Yeah. Abs overwhelming and... Um uh, scary. Yeah. Scary sometimes. Um, sh sure. And, and so part of my job is to make that not scary. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So when, and, you, when you work with these clients, uh, I wonder, you know, they're, they're coming in to see you and I, and I suppose that they all have different reasons for wanting to, to make transitions. And part of this, I guess, could be developmentally. They're in different phases of their lives or mm -hmm. different career reasons, whatever the reason is, or they're in college. But do you find, um, 
in in your work with clients that there there's something that they have in common you know what seems to be the underlying reasons or some of the themes that you found and why they want to make transitions mm, good question mm-hmm. so trend you you're you mentioned that they're wanting to make transitions, but sometimes change is just thrust upon us, and we yes, don't want. It. That's true. So I think it's important to remember both sides of that of that coin. Mm-hmm. If somebody uh, may lose a job, or or lose a, a partner, or mm-hmm. um, uh, not get the grade that they thought they want, or lose their self esteem, or you know those kinds of things get sometimes just thrust upon us. Mm-hmm. Maybe one of the underlying themes of transitions, even when it's a fabulous transition that we choose, like getting married or having a baby, I think with all of those things, the one common thread is endings. Ah, uh uh-huh. I don't know if you're familiar with, um, are you familiar with William Bridges' work on change? No, I'm not. William Bridges is, is, is somebody that I'm a huge fan of. He talks about transitions coming uh, in three stages. And the first stage of a transition is always an ending. Uh-huh. Not a beginning, it's an ending. And, and that those endings sometimes are by choice and sometimes they're thrust upon us. And then in that second stage of transitioning, there's this tendency for things to be out of focus, sometimes feeling chaotic or overwhelming or murky or not clear. And all of that is the second stage of transitions. And so even if it's something that you want, like that wedding, it's chaos getting there. <laughs> oh, exactly. Right? Sure it or, is. or if you have that new baby <laughs> and they're crying 24-7 and you can't figure out how to comfort them, that kind of change is, is really um, equally chaotic and, and self-doubt creeps in sometimes and frustration creeps in. And so all of those murky, muddy places that mm-hmm. you can end up in a change definitely are part of the, um, part, part of the, the journey. Exactly. And I think that as the mud starts to settle and the clarity starts to come, you end up with a new beginning. Mm. And that's how I often frame the transition that my clients are in, regardless of what it is. My, and, and I have to say that that sounds really simplistic, mm-hmm. but just speaking on a personal level, for me, it can also be really comforting to know that, oh, yeah, right now everything feels topsy-turvy, upside down, and I cannot f- figure out what's going on or which way I should go. That's right. I'm in that second stage mm-hmm. of of those changes. Mm-hmm. Um, I think about, I was 33 years old when my life partner died. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had been together 10 years. She died unexpectedly. Mm. My world was upside down. Uh And remembering just those simple stages of change helped me keep my bearing in a really crazy year. Mm. That's a great point. Well, I, well, you just mentioned something very important, Tamara, the stages of change. And this is something that we've talked about many times on the podcast episodes where not everybody is ready to change, right? Because what you just mentioned that, you know, sometimes change is thrust upon you and you don't have a choice, but you're not really thrilled about having to make the change. And it's not like you can expect a person who's coming into counseling just to kind of, you know, change at a snap of a finger that there's a lot that goes into, I guess, convincing yourself that, you know, I'm in this situation. Now, what do I do? And to have those conversations with somebody to help you understand that, okay, maybe I I do have to do some things, but boy, that's a real process, isn't it? It is a real process. And it makes me think about, um, it makes me think about therapists who refer to resistant clients. Yes. Sometimes I run into therapists who are all about their clients being so resistant to change or not buying into change. And so I love that you're asking this question because I think too many therapists think that a client who's unwilling to buy in or to make that next step in change, too often they think that 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 really is about a resistant client. And I should just like 
stir the stir the pot here, Chris, and tell you that I don't believe in resistant clients. Ah, you're like Steve DeShazer. I love Steve <laughs> DeShazer. <laughs> Thank you for saying so. That's so nice of you. Um, I I absolutely. Well, let me just back up and say that. In the last 30 years, I've worked with court-ordered, coerced clients in an agency working with DUI offenders Uh who often were in full denial of their addictions. And I've worked in um, different agencies working with teens who've been removed from their biological families by the court system who have... um, who were acting out behaviorally in just a bazillion different ways. They didn't think they had problems either. And I've worked as a felony probation officer along the way as well. And so, you know, if anybody should be able to talk about these clients, then I feel justified in being able to do that. And I have to say that clients who are in denial, individuals who think that the problem is their spouse or their boss or the president of the United States fault, those are my favorite clients to work with because of course all of us at different points in our lives are in denial about our responsibility in 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 certain areas of our lives. Mm-hmm. That's I think that's just a normal sure. part of life. Mm-hmm. And in my experience when clients aren't buying into what a therapist is selling, like taking that next step Mm -hmm. or um, owning their responsibility in doing something, I think that is 100% of the time because the therapist isn't selling the right thing Mm -hmm. at the right time at the right pace. When, when When my clients look like they are I really hate even using the word, but when when my clients appear to some people to be resistant, Mm -hmm. what I know is that I need to turn around and look at myself because I'm not hearing what they're saying. Mm. If I, and I think it's highly disrespectful, I have to say, to to even think about a client in in those terms. If I'm um, going at the pace my client needs me to go at, Mm-hmm. If I'm understanding what my client wants, yes. and if I'm going slow enough, giving them baby steps enough, then it's not going to be too scary or too fast or too difficult, whatever I'm asking them to do next. Mm-hmm. It's just going to be at their pace. So I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I think I just got off on one of my soapboxes. Well, but. No, I, no I, I completely agree. And actually, wouldn't you agree that if you're truly empathic, that you would try to look at what the function of, of the, quote, resistance is? Because Absolutely. whatever's going on there, there, there's a good reason why they're not cooperating or they're not kind of moving along in a way that you would expect them to. So it's too easy just to call them resistant, it's, Absolutely. It's, it's more important to look at what's the function of the behavior, some, what's going on behind there, and to really, if you're truly empathic, you'll see what's behind there. Absolutely. And if you can't, if you just can't get where your client is coming from or why they're not moving, or then, then the only place you need to look is in the mirror. Mm. I really and, – and, you know, um, this is an interesting time in this country – really to be having this conversation because although we're talking about what happens in the clinical hour in the privacy of our offices with our clients i really believe that that's equally true when we're talking about um uh the black lives matter movement and uh-huh. violence against police and the the you know the, the elections that are that oh, are yeah occur, I really feel like that if you don't get what that other side is talking about, Mm -hmm. you need to look inside. Counsel, you need to look inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes we don't want to do that. (laughs) And And sometimes we just can't see the forest for the trees. Certainly during this election process, that would be true for me sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm, I'm just human like everybody else. I know. I know. Well, you know, and I wonder because we're talking about women in transition, what yes. what is it that's different about women that make transition as opposed to men who make transition? I mean, are there any differences uh, between males and females along those transitional lines? Well, that's a really interesting question. I guess I haven't really thought about that yeah. because, hmm, because 
most of my clients just happen to be women. Uh-huh. I do have a few male clients, but I don't see that I necessarily work with them differently, although the themes, um, the life themes that bring them in, I suppose, might be different mm-hmm. and in that when I think about the men that come to see me, they are often it is work related uh-huh. or or spouse imposed. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> and and I guess the other thing I would say about that is to the extent that men and women tend to display different emotions. Hmm. Um to, that that our focus might be a little bit different there. You know, I, I'm thinking um, uh, men are often more comfortable expressing anger, less comfortable expressing fear. Mm. Women tend to be more comfortable expressing sadness or fear, oftentimes, mm. and and less comfortable expressing anger. Why do you think but that is? But certainly, Tim? all those feelings. Well, or why, present. Why do you think there are differences man- that way? Partly manifest. Yeah, and I was just going to say, why do you think that there are differences in how men and women express feelings or what's okay to express? I mean, where do you think that comes from? I think you're teasing me, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. I'm, I'm teasing you up teasing here. Me, but, but I'll go there. <laughs> I, I think we just teach little boys and little girls different things about what is and isn't appropriate. Yeah. Back to those family patterns of, of mm-hmm. um, emotions that were allowed to be expressed, emotions that were expressed in those families in appropriate and inappropriate ways, feelings that were um, safer to express. Yeah. That That's my take on it. What do you think? I think, I think you're right on target there, and, and I wonder – if that's going to start to change um, in the next generation or two, if we're going to start Why are seeing you thinking that? Yeah, less distinct differences and maybe more commonalities, and, and maybe those will start to wash away over the course of time. I would hope so, mm-hmm. because I think when we have the freedom to feel all of our feelings and we have the freedom to express all of our feelings in appropriate ways, I think we have much more... Um, cognitive flexibility. You know, your your guest you had on, your, your last podcast guest mm-hmm. that I listened to, mm-hmm. um, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Matt Boone? But yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, he was talking about um, uh, ACT and, and yeah. that cognitive flexibility piece, I think, is key. That's right. That's exactly right. That well, was what- a great interview. Way. Well, I'll tell you, he's he's a great guy. I mean, um, we he he was just here for a uh, a workshop in Nashville a week or two ago, and I had a student that went to it and said it was just phenomenal. It was a excellent. Uh, yeah, I'm not surprised at all. Yeah, it was a two day workshop, highly experiential, and she just loved that workshop. So, yeah. So, and he, and he tours, I think, the United States doing these kinds of workshops. So, uh, yeah, anybody who wants to do that kind of work or wants to learn more about it, go to, go to Matt Boone's uh, workshop if you can. Well, you, you really milked him for a lot of juicy information in uh, that one interview. I was impressed. I t- well, like I told you, Tamara, I mean, I want to, I learn as much as I can. And I'll tell you, that's, that's my whole branding for, for me and my, my practice is that uh, healing through learning. I think that the more that we learn about ourselves, about other people, that's key to mental wellness. That's just kind of I, one of my core beliefs. So, well, we're at the point of the podcast now where um, I'd like to talk to guests about their recipe for success. So you, you have these clients, women in transition, they're coming in to see you. Um, they're having the, whatever their issues are, whatever transitions are going through, they're coming in, seeing you, they're at point A needing help. Um, so what do you do at point A and to Mm -hmm. help move them to point B where they're no longer having these issues? They seem to be successfully dealing with the transitions. What, what is it that you do that kind of helps them move from point A to point B, Tamara? Yeah. Um, so um, I really help them float up and identify their old screwy rules and patterns <laughs> that used to work maybe and kept them safe and sane as a kid, yeah. but now seem to be tripping them up or or keeping them stuck. Mm-hmm. And um, 
then I ask them to consider the ways those rules and patterns are working for them Mm -hmm. and how they're working against them and if they want to change them, how they want to change them. Um, We focus on what they might want to implement instead of those old screwy rules. Mm -hmm. Um, We talk about William Bridges' work at some point usually about uh, those endings and that mucky middle stuff and the new beginnings um, and and really just give them space to make those choices along the way. Yeah, that makes sense. To make those more visible to them, more obvious to them, so that they're not just walking along unconsciously, hanging on to their childhood rules that were fabulous, but... Um, are getting in the way now. Really, if it's a more more conscious choice, yeah. then there usually are more choices. You've you've mentioned those rules uh, several times in this interview. How do you go yeah. about helping them access those rules or identify you know what those rules are? I mean, that's that's mm-hmm. got to be a real core part of what you do with with clients, and and I I'm totally in agreement with that. But I'm just kind of curious. How is it that you do that? I mean, it makes sense, but yeah. you know, just from a practical standpoint, what's involved in doing that? So um, maybe my client is maybe my client is a couple, uh-huh. or one person of a couple, one part of a couple who, and maybe they're arguing over money. Uh-huh. <laughs> And so what I would do with that is help them float up those old money beliefs. So I would ask them questions, and we would have conversations around things like, so what's your earliest memory of money, and Uh how did you start making money in the beginning, and were there rules related to allowances or jobs or work, and did you hear your parents talk about money as a child, and did they argue about money? And maybe you were raised in a family who had less than enough. Maybe you were raised in a family that had more than enough. Maybe you were raised in a family who had enough. I would help that client kind of look at all of those things and maybe even look at her grandparents' things. Like maybe I would use a genogram or or, um, a life story to help her look at her whole family's um, way of interacting with money, what that meant for them. Was that about power? Was that about success? Was it about accessing resources or Mm -hmm. other things? Um, And so we would have um, maybe a few conversations about that stuff. I might ask the client to write about those things or uh, interview other significant others in her history about those things. And then we would come back and look, ask, um, really talk about what are the rules or guidelines or mm-hmm. patterns that she saw, the themes that she saw related to money. And maybe if she was raised in a family um, as a child that did not have enough, maybe they had to really struggle and scrimp to get by. And maybe she didn't get new shoes every year, or maybe she didn't get, um, maybe she couldn't afford all her school supplies when she was a kid. Mm -hmm. Those kinds of things really set us up. I think about, I think about my, my mom and dad, my dad was a, um, he was a child. He was a young adult during the great depression. Uh Uh-huh. And so he used to tell stories about it, living in Fort Worth during the Depression, not having enough money for food. And he and his brother would walk the railroad tracks in Fort Worth, Texas, by the bean factory. And the bean factory would throw out the reject cans of beans. Oh. And my brother would go and pick those up. My mom, on the other hand, was raised in the mountains of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Um, and the stories I heard about her family growing up were that she, that they were the first family in the County to get electricity in their house. Oh, wow. They were the first, they used to refer, they used to keep their dairy cold by putting their dairy products in the Creek in front of their house. Is that right? They were the first family, according to her. Now, truthfully, I don't know if any of this is true, but this is the story they would tell. Sure, sure. They were the first family to get a refrigerator or an, huh. in the house. They were the first family to get a car in the county. So can you imagine the kinds of conversations that that Depression-era young man and this 
young woman that was my to be my mom yeah. who apparently they may not have been wealthy but they were land rich they did own a lot of land in that particular county and they had at least enough resources that they could be the first to get you know that'd be like getting the first computer in your county now oh sure exactly <laughs> <laughs> and so you can imagine that I got a few messages about money, and not all of those money messages were consistent with each other <laughs> Growing, as a child sure. when I grew up. Oh, exactly. so, so I would help my client kind of parse through those family stories and, and experiences, float up those rules and practices that may or may not have been consistent, but she certainly bought into some of those along the way. And then we would look at how that relates to maybe her spouse and the stories that he got and his experiences and his rules. Mm -hmm. And we would see, do all of these still fit? Because, of course, if you're the Depression-era young man who grows up to have a family, and now you're middle class, solid middle class, mm -hmm. you have enough. You have enough to buy your kid more dolls than I ever deserved. <laughs> you know? We weren't sure. rich, but I, had, I grew up with more than enough right. in many ways. Yep. And never worried about money as a child. That Depression-era, those Depression-era penny-pinching rules at 56 years of age, still affect me now. <laughs> wow. And, and yeah, I think about when I first went into private practice, how I pinched pennies, ridiculously oh, pinched pennies, yeah. did not invest in, you know, basic things that a therapist needs, like office equipment. <laughs> <laughs> and so I would help my client have those conversations and figure those things out. And maybe we would laugh at some of those silly things that made so much sense as a child, but no longer fit for her as an adult. Yeah. Mental note takers, as you listen to Tamara talk about rules, what are your rules? Can you identify, maybe you were starting to think about some of your own rules as you were growing up that you're still operating by, and, and perhaps some of those rules, they aren't working so well for you, either in, in relationships or in other areas of your life. And, and maybe there's it's, it's something to take a look at. And, and Tamara, as you talk about your work with these clients, Tell us a little bit about what the challenges, what, what some of the primary challenges are. And, and, and I guess that one of those might be kind of gets back to the stages of change thing. But are there any other types of challenges in, in working with women in transition? Um, that's a good question. I, I think I think that some of the challenges revolve around giving themselves permission ah. to take, take, take the time mm -hmm. to look honestly at their stuff, their stories, their experiences. Um, it's, you know, in this day and age in our field with the um, impact that, that managed care has had on our field in particular mm -hmm. in the last 30 years, yep. this quick fix, put a Band-Aid on it, deal with the symptom, not the problem right. kind of thing that is going on. Yep. I think that that has set that and, and perhaps the um, impact that the Internet has had for, has given us quick answers, quick access to, to solutions that may not be real solutions. Mm -hmm. And so... For, for off, not often, but sometimes, young women will come in and they will want to have this resolved in three sessions. Now fix me. And while sometimes <laughs> that certainly is possible, it is often not the case. Yes. <laughs> and, and so that has been a, an ongoing issue. And, and certainly as we, the culture that in this country in particular, I know you probably have listeners from around the world, but since I'm situated here in the U S with you, I can say that um, we bring our daughters up in particular to be focused on everybody else's needs other than their own. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. And so a, a client may come in with an ouch you know, an identified problem that she wants to fix, but she hasn't necessarily identified why that problem is in place and what keeps it in place. And that becomes part of the work that needs to be done with me. Mm -hmm. And you're expecting that three session turnaround and you don't give yourself permission to have four sessions or five sessions or whatever it is, mm -hmm. then 
sometimes you leave with a Band-Aid instead of a solution. Yeah, and then it, and then it uh, rears its ugly head again sometime down the road. and Over and, and over. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that the truth? It is the truth, and usually it comes more often. Uh, that, that, that when it rears its head, it comes more often over time, and it sticks around longer over time, and it creates more havoc over time until, of course, we sit down and clean up our messes. Exactly. And then, and then the client thinks, I went to that Tamara Subtle. Why didn't she help me with this problem? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, try, I, 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 I certainly, I think, have been on the other end of that as well. Yeah. I've been that that client who who was frustrated that she didn't get what she wanted or what yeah. she needed when she thought she wanted or needed it. Yep. And and I have to say that I think that all the work we do with our clients is planting seeds. Oh, and sure. when the right time is right, when when the time is right um, and the conditions are right, they'll get that next piece. Yeah, and I, I certainly agree with that. And it, it go, always goes back f- to, to, for me to the stages of change. And so yeah. they, might be, they might not be ready at that point in time to change. And it might not be a good time. For whatever reason, it might not be a good time to change. But you're exactly right. right. You might be planting the seed. So whoever works with them next, it might be you again or it might be somebody else that they're ready, yep. to, they're ready to work at that point in time for, for a good reason, p- b- because they're ready to make the change. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes my job is to plant the seed. Sometimes my job is to hoe and weed around the seed that somebody yeah. else is planted. Sometimes it's to water it, and sometimes it is to be able to to get the honor of seeing that come into full fruition. But yes, um, it's all part of the job. Yeah, that's a nice metaphor. Love every bit of it. Yes, nice metaphor. Well, this last part of the interview, I, I talk about this as make a mental note, and I always like my guests to talk a little bit about. Um, tips or words of wisdom that they can share with the audience members, ways of improving their mental wellness or relationships, even if just a little bit. Do you have any tips or words of wisdom for the mental note takers, Tamara? Yeah. I, I, you, you remember there's two different um, groups that, that tend to, to, to come to me for counseling. One of those are women and one of those are professional caregivers, and often those overlap with each other. And I think that whether I'm talking about women in transition or I'm talking about those professional caregivers, often those two groups are the worst at reaching out and getting the support that they need. Right. We often put our own needs uh, aside to meet the needs of others first, and we never get around to taking care of our own stuff. And, mm-hmm. and you know, that may look like... Um, a relationship in our house that needs taking care of, or it might look like um, stepping out into our own business, or it might look like we're feed, um, we need to feed our own spirits or our spiritual lives better, or maybe it looks like we just need to make the change to a new physician for our annual health care. Yeah. Uh, what, whatever it is, I think that if we, I, I want to encourage and remind your mental note takers that it is important for you to reach out, especially if you're those women in transition or those professional caregivers. It really is okay and critically important that you find the support you need and trust that what you're experiencing is there to help you focus on what needs to be noticed and needs to be cleaned up and that there's lots of right ways to do that job. What's not okay What's not okay, what you don't want to have happen is to slip down that slippery slope of ignoring what you need and failing to get you taken care of. We absolutely all deserve and you deserve to experience joy and satisfaction in your personal and professional life. And if you, if you get so focused on taking care of everybody else or pleasing everybody else, you're going to be missing opportunities that were meant just for you. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And, and you know, I, I've been in the situation, and perhaps you have too, but I was in a situation several years ago where I needed to uh, change some things about myself. And, you know, mm-hmm. as, as a, a helping professional, I'm thinking, well, I should be able to do this my, by myself. You know, I, I'm a professional, <laughs> and, you know, I know all this, I study all this stuff. But, yep. you know, it just, it's not that easy. That was my rule, that I should be able to do this, you know. Yes. And uh, it's like, 
I, I can't. I can't do this. And I went into counseling, and I'm so glad I did. Um, and, but, you know, you have to really come to terms with yourself and look at what are my own rules and how are they, how are they making things difficult for me in my life and what do I need to do to change things for the better? Absolutely. I have so 100% been there, and I'm sure I'll be there again. (laughs) Because I think that's just the nature of life. We keep getting those little lessons until we get the lessons. That's right. That's exactly right. Well, Tamara, if a potential client uh, wants to contact you, if they're interested in setting up an appointment with you, how can they do that? And also, uh, perhaps you can share a little bit about your blog as well. Oh, sure. So thank you for asking. Um, if, if you want to continue the conversation or simply check out more about me and my work or reach me directly, you can go to my website, which is www.tamrasuttle, it's T-A-M-A-R-A-S-U-T-T-L-E.com. Um, and that's the easiest way to reach me. Okay. Um, I guess my blog is Private Practice from the Inside Out, and really it focuses on a subset of your audience, which are um, mental health professionals that are interested in building a private practice. I have tons of free information there. I do uh, some training and and offer some online and face-to-face classes. I'm always looking for opportunities to head to your beautiful part of the world, so Uh I'm hoping, Chris, you'll, you'll uh, let me know if there's an opportunity of to come course. and talk to you guys. I'm, uh, uh, I teach a blog start for therapist class, and so I end up with therapists and other healthcare providers who are interested in blogging. Um, I'm headed to Omaha at the end of the month to talk in Nebraska about money madness in private practice. I guess that's why my <laughs> samples today were money focused. Sorry about that. <laughs> I hadn't, didn't think about that till just now. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so I'm happy to talk with you people, your people and uh, happy to be introduced to them. Thank you so oh, much. Sure. Well, we'll I'll put all that information in the show notes so people can access that if they like to. And oh, I like right. to, um, I like to just personally thank you for coming on the, on the podcast. Tamara. I, I understand that you are very busy and, you participate in a lot of these podcasts and have a lot going on. So I really appreciate you coming on today. You are very kind, Chris. I look forward to networking with you. You too. Okay, thanks. Have a good day. Yep. Wow. I'm not sure where Tamara gets all of her energy, but I was obviously feeding off it. It was a blast doing that interview with her. Well, here's my mental notes takeaway from the interview. A key to making transitions is identifying rules and patterns that were developed during childhood and may have served a useful purpose at that time, but interfere with decisions to make change that lead to happiness and satisfaction in life. Okay, since uh, education is key to mental wellness, let's see how much you learn from today's podcast episode. What is the common theme or thread of transitions. Tamara said that the common thread is endings. Even positive transitions, um, like entering into intimate relationships or marriage, involve endings, like giving up some level of independence and autonomous decision-making. Tamara also noted that some transitions are thrust upon people, and so they're in a position of having to, des- having to decide how they're going to deal with them. And in some cases, r- those rules and ways of approaching life that were learned way back in childhood make it challenging to deal with these changes in ways that lead to happiness and satisfaction with life. All right, as always, you can find the show notes for today's podcast episode on my website, chriscorto.com. And have you subscribed to the Make a Mental Note Note podcast series yet? And if you haven't, it's really easy. Just uh, install the Downcast app onto your phone and search for Make a Mental Note and click on subscribe. That's all there is to it. Thanks for listening and have a great rest of the week. 